Hey, well, good morning to you. What a great day to praise the Lord, huh? If you guys would, stand to your feet, and let's sing some praises. Oh, I can wash away my sin Nothing but the blood of Jesus What can make me whole again Nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh, precious is the blood That makes me white Nothing but the blood of Jesus And this is all my righteousness Nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh, precious is the blood That makes me white as snow No other found I know Nothing but From your passion and pride, there's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. Oh, there is power, thing and power, a wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. Oh, there is power, power. To work in power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Sing it out loud now. Oh, there is power, power. To work in power in the blood, in the blood of the Lamb. Of the Lamb. Oh, there is power, power, a wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. In the precious blood of the Lamb. Praise the Lord. You may be seated if you can. Amen. Praise God, there's power in the blood. Amen. If it wasn't, we wouldn't be saved. Amen. If it wasn't for that power of the blood that washes our sins as white as snow. And so we got a lot to praise God for. Amen. Because I'll tell you what, if nothing's going right in your life and you're saved, you got a lot going on. Amen. Praise God. And so you got a lot to praise the Lord for. It's good to see you in the house of the Lord, especially good to see our first time guests with us today. This is your very first time. We welcome you to Believer's Fellowship. We hope you're already enjoying the presence of the Lord in this place and feel God's 
just touch on your heart and life, and we're just so glad that you're here, and we rejoice with you that you're here to join us in fellowship and in love with the Lord. Eventually, the, the Lord's Supper today as we join together to do that. Amen? So, praise the Lord. We want to welcome you. If you came in, you should have received one of these welcome cards like are on the screen. If you happen to get missed, there's some in the chairs in front of you. Uh, little pockets there. You can grab one of those welcome cards and fill it out. We'd appreciate you doing that. There's a spot on there to put your prayer request. If you'd like us to be praying for you, we'd consider that an honor to do that with you and for you. Uh, so be sure to put that down there as well. Hang on to that. We've got a gift that we'd like to give you at the end of the service. But our folks would like to personally welcome you. So if you are a very first time guest, you just relax and remain seated. Members, regular attenders, get up from where you are and welcome our guests. Amen. Praise the Lord. As you make your way back to your seats, if you'd stay standing, we're going to have our scripture reading today. We've asked Rebecca to come and read, but before she does, I would like to say a couple of things. Rebecca, won't you come on up? Uh, this week has been a, a great blessing and a, and a hardship for us. Uh, as you know, we our youngest daughter had her first baby, so we're praising the Lord for that, to add to our grandparenthood. Thank you for your prayers on that, and uh, we're just rejoicing uh, that God blessed us with one more person that we're praying for to grow up and spread the gospel. And so we're, we're rejoicing in that. Also, though, there's been some tragedies, as you know, uh, John Cunningham's uh, dad passed away, and then also at our spring campus, David Lowry passed away. And so uh, he was born with spina bifida, never walked a day in his life, was in a wheelchair for 50 plus years, and uh, now he's walking. Amen. Amen. Thank and you, Lord. So uh, when we, uh, I knew David for 30 years, and for probably 20 of that, his dad passed away about 20 years ago. And he asked me, he said, since dad passed away, I used to sit by him. Can I sit by you? And so for 20 years, he sat next to me with my arm on his wheelchair. And when we were called to come to be the campus pastor over here, I told Rebecca one of the hardest things is going to be is leaving David with not sitting next to him. So, But I know he's going to be in heaven when I get there, and we'll be rejoicing again. So be praying for these families, and when we pray, at the end of the scripture reading, we'll be lifting up these families as well. So, Rebecca, won't you read our scripture for us? First Corinthians eleven twenty three through twenty six. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, "This is my body." which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. 
do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come before you. God, we, we're just overwhelmed of your great love for us. God, that you would die on the cross to pay for our sins. And Father, as we gather here today, God, may our focus, may our attention be solely upon you. Father, because you've given us so much. Father, we just pray that as we gather together and we worship and we hear the word, Father, may, may you be glorified. Lord, may people be drawn to you. May, may people who don't know you even as their Savior today make that day so special in their heart that they would receive your grace and mercy and forgiveness and, and be heaven bound. Father, we lift up the Lowry family and the Cunningham family, Lord, during this loss, Father. God, we just pray that you would just grace them with your peace and your comfort. and your, God, that you'd be there all in all during this time, Father God. And they'd look back and see that you walked them through. You carried them through with your grace and your mercy. We love you, God, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stay standing as we worship the Lord. As we begin to sing this song, just remember that as we sing, God, thank you for your goodness. Remember that not only is God amazing, but as you begin to sing, you're worshiping God, but you're blessing God. Like God has a heart. God has feelings. God feels pain. God feels so much. And we don't really think about that often. So as we sing this, let us really thank him this morning and have a heart of gratitude and realize we're really talking to God this morning. And his presence fills the place where people come together as one in his name. Let's sing this together. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. Cause all my life you have been Every breath that I am made, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in the darkest night. You were close like no other. I've known you as a father, and I've known you as a friend. running after, it's running after me, 
Praise the Lord. You may be seated. I thought we were going to rise right then. Amen. That would have been a great time, wouldn't it, to rapture at that very moment. So praise the Lord for the time of worship that's prepared our heart to get ready for the Lord's Supper. And today we'll be remembering the Lamb of God. And that song that we just sang was worthy is the Lamb. And because He is worthy, and we'll be looking at that today as before we take part in the Lord's Supper. Uh, just a few things to remember when it says remembering is because that's what we're here to do for this Lord's Supper. I grew up in the traditional Baptist church and that little table up there you'd always see in remembrance of me. It's a constant reminder that that's what this meal is all about. Matter of fact, we read when Rebecca read that scripture twice in there, it talks about in remembrance of me, in remembrance of me, that that's the the whole focus here is for our minds to get focused to remember Christ. Amen. Not remember maybe what we've got in the oven to this evening and what we've got to do next week and the meeting we've got to do and the interview we may have today, we're focused on remembering Him. That that's got to be our main focus. And you say, well, why'd you use this phrase, the Lamb of God? I, I just feel like it's important for us to see him in this light when we look at this meal today. Uh, matter of fact, well, let me go back before I even mention those verses. Oh, yeah, it doesn't go back. If you'll go back for me one, I wanted to mention one thing. The Lamb of God is mentioned one time in the Old Testament, two times in the Gospels, one time in the Epistles, and then 28 times in the book of Revelation. One, 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 and in Revelation when it says the revelation of Jesus Christ that book is written to reveal Jesus, that God's going to reveal His Son in this great light of revelation. And He calls Him the Son, the, the Lamb of God, 28 times. It's, it's just so, I think, as we're in the last days, as you were with us during when we studied Revelation for about a year, uh, we see that we're in the last days, and I believe even as we enter the last days, we need to be thinking Him more as the Lamb of God. That was slain. And so we can see so many. I'm not using all 28, but it says, And they overcame him with, because of the blood of the Lamb. And thir in 13.8, it was the book of the life of the Lamb. And then in Revelations, we're going to attend the marriage supper of the Lamb. And this is a, a great title that Christ has. He has so many. I don't think you can categorize them as the best, but this one means so much to me, and I... I believe at the end of the message, it'll mean so much to you as well. I wanted to just hit three points about this deal. First, let's remember your search for the lamb. You know, Isaiah, Isaac was in search of a lamb, but uh, Abraham had waited for the promised child for about 100 years and never got it. And then God finally blessed him with a son, with Isaac. And then Isaac, he said, take Isaac and take him up upon the mount and offer him as a sacrifice. You're thinking, how could God do that? He waited 100 years to get the child, and now he's going to take the child up on the mountain to sacrifice him. And he does, and they make their way up there, and on the way up to do the sacrifice, we see in 22, for he, Isaac, said, look, the fire, the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Isaac asked his father Abraham the question, where is the lamb? Where is it? I see, I'm doing an inventory, Dad. I noticed you, you remembered the wood. You got the stuff for the fire, but there seems to be one thing missing on this inventory list. Where's the lamb? You forgot something. And so the very first question in Genesis is, where's the lamb? We need to find the lamb. We need a lamb. Eventually it's going to be the lamb and then, of course, Abraham makes that great statement. God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. God's going to provide it. And, of course, we see that beautiful picture. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by the thorns. What a great picture of Christ with the crown of thorns on his head. We've got a lamb with a crown of thorns on the lamb's head. And when you see that deal, he raised his eyes and looked. I believe he not only saw that lamb, he looked forward to a lamb, the lamb that would be provided by God. Because he said God would provide for himself a lamb. And so even in that, they were looking for the lamb. 
Do you remember when you were searching for the lamb? Matter of fact, it wasn't. We were so sinful that it, the Bible says that it, the Spirit has to draw us. Even when we say we're searching, we're searching because he began to draw us. We were so in our sin. I don't care if you grew up in church and you were moral most of your life. You know, it doesn't matter. We still were searching our own way and our own pride. And God drew us. But while he was drawing us and we searched, but everybody is searching. They, I believe everybody in the whole world searching. They, they just don't know what they're searching for. They're searching for the wrong things in the wrong places. Drugs, alcohol, fame, money, relationships, whatever, something to fulfill their life. But what they're really looking for is the question, where's the lamb? They need to find it. They need to find him. That's what everybody's searching for. Where is happiness? Where is joy? I'll tell you where it is when you find the lamb. And that's what we all need to search for. And we were searching, many of us, in the wrong places, in the wrong time. But praise God, in his continual drawing, we were able to keep searching and then really find out what we were searching for, the lamb. This is what I was looking for all my life, and I never knew it. And we can praise God for that. Not only were we searching or remember, we should be remembering today when we search for the lamb. We remember when, when Abraham went up and took the ram and he offered him for a burnt offering. What? In place of his son. It took the place of his son. And we're going to find out our lamb took our place. Remember, you're finding the lamb. When John the Baptist, it says the next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the lamb. Isn't it great that the Old Testament asks the question, where's the lamb? And the New Testament answers the question, behold, there he is right there. We've been looking for him. That's the whole gospel right there. Shut your Bible and you can contain it in those two questions. Where is he? There he is right there. That's who we've been looking for from Genesis on. It's been telling us, look for that lamb. And John said, there he is. That's what we've been looking for since... Abraham asked that, Isaac asked that question, where is he? He's right there. We can see him and all those lambs that died and all those lambs that, that had to give their sacrifice, those little lambs, they weren't enough. The Bible says, for it's impossible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. You know, men kept bringing lambs all during Passover. But this time... God brought this lamb. Because it's not the lamb of men, it's the lamb of God. He brought this one. And this one was the one we were looking for. All those ones that died, they didn't do the trick. But when God provided his lamb, then his lamb forgave us of our sins by receiving his as our Savior. You could wrap up the gospel. Somebody says, what's the gospel? Genesis, where is it? The Gospels, here he is. If you wanted to make a Reader's Digest version of the Bible, we see that that's where it is. And then the third point that we need to remember is remember your gratitude and praise for what the Lamb did for you. You need to be doing that today. If you had not done it in a while, do it because when the angels, when we stand in heaven in the book of Revelation, you can see the angels, the church, believers, saying with a loud voice, what? Worthy is the lamb that was slain. That's what we're going to be doing. Now it's wrapped up. Where is he? Behold, there he is. And now for the rest of our life, from the day we get saved till the all of eternity, we're going to be saying what? Worthy is the lamb that was slain. And you can add a little bit on to the end of that deal. For me. For me. He would do that for me. Not just for the whole world that he chose me to die for. And that's going to be all of our praise. That's why when we sing and praise, this is what we're thinking about. We're thinking about, he did that for me. That's why I sing. That's why I praise. That's why I read my Bible. That's why I come to church. He did that for me. And he's worthy. It happened to me. It didn't just, I didn't even read about it. I experienced it. it he's worthy of all that we could give him. And I'm not going to re-preach Revelation, which I will probably soon, even though we just got through. Uh, look what it says in 13. And every created thing which is in heaven 
and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea. That's everything. And all things in them I heard saying to him who sits on the throne, to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. The elders, if you want to know, if you walk through this revelation, that's the church. That's all believers from all time. They just fell down and worshiped the Lamb. Just, he's just worthy of so much blessing. He's worthy of so much honor. He's so, worthy of so much glory. He's worthy of so much dominion, just endless. And we won't have time enough in all of eternity to give him all he deserves, but we're going to keep pouring it out. But we all not do it and wait till then. Come on. <laughs> this is rehearsal. Just rehearsal for making that lamb and our... He, look, he already is worthy. The Bible says magnify the Lord. How can you magnify him? He's already magnified. But we magnify him to everybody else that we go around. And he's worthy, but we, we sing like he is. We praise like he is. We live like he is, that he really is worthy. And that's what we do when we look at him and say, man, even the church falls down, the believers fall down and worship him. They just can't get over it. Like Bill Stafford, you said, just have a spell. You know, just, I just, they just can't contain themselves. And so with all of that, we prepare by remembering him as we look and what the Bible says for us to get ready for this meal. What do we do to get ready? It says, therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself. And in doing so, he is to eat and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. But if, you, if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. A lot of people say, well, Brother Tim, I'm not worthy. I know, we're not. Matter of fact, in the book of Revelation, when they got ready to open the seals, they said, who's worthy to open the seals? And they said, nobody. And they started mourning and weeping like, there's nobody worthy. There's nobody anywhere that can open the seal because there's not one single worthy person. So it can't mean that until they said, oh, here's the lamb. He's worthy to open the seals. He's worthy. He's the only one worthy. It doesn't say come and be worthy. It says in an unworthy manner. In an unworthy manner. So it's not being worthy, because he's the only one that's worthy, but it's doing it in an unworthy manner, what, that our hearts are not right. And look at how serious this is. I mean, this is serious words that it says that we drink judgment to ourselves. Matter of fact, if we don't do it seriously, it could cause us to get sick, and it could cause us to die early. Now, a lot of people say, well, I think I'll pass it. That's not the issue either, because you're still going to live the way you're living, and still the next day, with the same judgment, but it's saying do that here before you do the Lord's Supper. Make sure that your hearts are right. You know, it used to be like in a family. We're in a family. We're taking this as a family. You remember if you, if you, you know, your mom or dad might say, hey, you need to get that right and straighten up and behave because daddy's fixing to be home. <laughs> in other words, if you'll straighten up yourself and examine yourself, then daddy doesn't have to do some actions when he gets home. God's just saying, hey, take care of business, get right with me, and then you won't be received the chastening hand of God. So you think, well, what should we examine ourselves with? We'll just hit these two questions quickly. As you examine yourself, you need to ask yourself two questions. What's that? Number one, is Jesus my Savior? Is he my Lamb of God? Have I received him as my personal Lord and Savior and the forgiveness of sin? You know, <clears throat> if you look at that deal, it says in Exodus, when it talks about the Passover lamb, they are each to take a lamb for themselves. And then in verse 4, according to what each man should eat, you should divide the lamb. Your lamb shall be unblemished male of one year old. You know, for a lot of people, 
Jesus is a lamb. They know who he was. They read about him. They've heard Bible stories about him. And they said, you know what? He's a lamb. He's a historic figure. He's somebody that lived on this earth. But that's not enough for him to just be a lamb. Have you ever noticed the progression in this passage? Oh, to some people, they find out, you know, he really is the lamb. He is really the son of God. He really did die on the cross. He really did do what he said he's going to do. But that's not enough. Just to know that he is the lamb. So you've moved from A, you've moved to the, but that's not enough. Have you not noticed the Passover progression? Is he your lamb? A, uh uh-uh. The, uh uh-uh. Your. Oh, personally, he's my lamb. He died on the cross for me. And I remember him dying on the cross for me. And he's your lamb. That's why a lot of people don't get church. They don't get worship. They don't get commitment and faithfulness because they've experienced A. They've experienced the. Oh, but when you experience your. Woo, that's when it all turns around that it was for me, I just can't get over that, that he would do that for me. And when I realized he had died as a lamb for me, it just changed everything. Have you got to the year part? Oh, you're close if you're at the the. You're right at the door. Man, open the door and make him your. And your life will never be the same. And you'll know what all of what they call us fanatics are all about because you'll think... I'm going to become one of them if I do that. Well, you will. And so that's the first part, is to just do that if you've never come to know Christ. And then the last one is, is everything right between me and my Savior? If it's not, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and righteousness to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's all. you got to just say, you know what? He's already my lamb. I've already received Him as my lamb. But you know what? There's some things in my life right now that just aren't right. I've got some commitments. I may have some unforgiveness in my heart towards somebody. I may have an issue that I'm still hanging on to. I've got a sin I just hadn't repented of. Whatever the case is, I don't need to list. Why? Because right now I hope you're examining yourself. And God doesn't have to do it for you. Do it yourself. And nobody really knows it but you. You don't know mine. I don't know yours. And that's okay. Okay. Examine yourself. And you're saying, well, that's not good. No, that's the best thing you can do because now you can, whatever has kept you from having that sweet fellowship with him now can be dealt with. And you can be forgiven and you can be righteous again in his sight because he died for the cro- on the cross for your sins and now you can be made practically right with him. You can do that right now. Is get those things right between you and the Lord. And then we can actually remember. We can truly remember. You know, I think one of the hardest hospital visits I ever made was about 20 years ago. We had a young lady, matter of fact, Brother Joe mentioned it in his sermon last week. I was thinking, I already had this in my notes, and I was thinking he mentioned this person last week that was born with an illness that they knew they could never recover from. And when they did, they were young, and he had mentioned that the church raised money for them to get a lung transplant. And we got news. She was probably, oh, I think 20, maybe 19, 20, somewhere in there, 19 years old. I know I had made more hospital visits to that one person than I made to anybody else because she was actually the phrase in the hospital more than out of the hospital. And we got word that she passed away. And I remember that day so well, myself, Pastor Joe, and our youth pastor went up to the hospital. And I remember opening that door. And there was a mom of a 19 or 20-year-old with her holding her daughter like a baby. Remember that? And I had two daughters at home. And she just had got her out of that hospital bed and had her in her arms like that just crying because her daughter was dead and I'll never ever the rest of my life forget what she said she said you know what the last word she told me 
She said, Mom, promise me to never forget me. Those are the last words she spoke. Mom, promise me you'll never forget me. Now, she didn't mean like, oh, what was my daughter's daughter's name? Or did I have a daughter? No, she meant regularly. Remember me. Don't go a long time without thinking about me like I'm just gone now and you don't think about me anymore. And I thought Jesus said, remember me. Because we live life sometime where we really, we know Jesus, who he is, but do you really remember him like this mother's daughter said, Mom, don't ever forget me. Let's really, really remember Jesus today. In a way, maybe you've never remembered him ever. And if you've said, man, I can't get into this because I've never experienced this, this great remembrance that you are talking about, let today be the day that you can. That it'll be what you remember for the rest of your life of what he did for you. And you can say, you know what, this meal is going to mean a lot to me because of what he did for me on Calvary. So let's have this time that we can examine. So if you'd stand to your feet, we're going to have a time where we can just do business with the Father. And right where you are, or you can come down the front. I'm going to be down front for a few moments. If you've never come to know Christ, we'd love to share with you how to come to know Christ. If you've got some issues that God has said, examine yourself and all these things that he brought to light, you're seeing, then take care of that. Whether it's at your chair, here at the altar, wherever, just... The location's not the issue. The heart is the issue. Get your hearts right with God. Experience revival in your heart once again. Maybe the flame has grown low because your commitments have grown low and you need to get revived back. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we approach your table, Lord, with great seriousness. And Father, as we remember you, Lord, and we examine our hearts, Father, we pray that you'd bring to light anything that we don't see, any issue that we're failing to see, Lord. Lord, we know you'll be faithful to show us as we examine our hearts. Lord, I just pray for the strength for each of us, Father, that not only as you reveal it, but to confess it, to let you cleanse it, and for us to forsake it and to just be revived, Lord, you're not bringing condemnation, you're bringing conviction so that we can have revival in the glorious act of walking with you in peace and guilt-free. Father, I also pray for those that's never come to know you, Father. Maybe even right now they're under conviction. Just let them let go and receive you, Lord as their personal Lord and Savior, that they would forsake their sins and turn to Christ in the forgiveness of sin. Father, we pray you'd take over this time as we focus on you and being right with you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd stay standing as the music team plays lightly, you just respond as the Lord would lead you. Whether you're getting right there or you're coming forward, we just want to be able to pray with you and help you in whatever way we can.
And you may, uh, you may be seated. As a church, uh, we practice what's called open communion. So that means, you know, some churches practice closed communion, that you have to be a member of that church. We practice open communion. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you're welcome to participate in today's communion. And uh, it's open to all. And so please feel free to participate and be a part of what God's doing and what God wants to do in your life. Amen. Uh, at this time, I'd like our men that's going to end up serving, if they would come forward at this time. these men will be passing out the elements. We would ask you that once you take one, if you'll hold it, don't take part in it, just hold it. And while you're holding it, especially this first part, which is the bread, which represents the body of Christ, if you'll just take that time to hold that and be thinking on what Christ did for you. We'll be talking about that element in greater detail. But for now, when you hold it, be thinking of Christ's body that was broken, not for everybody, but for you and what he means to you. And so just hold it and we'll be discussing it and praying over it in just a moment. Man, if you'll go ahead. He was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our sin. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds, by his wounds we are here. He was pierced for our transgression, crushed for our sin. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, by his wounds we are here. We are healed by your sacrifice in the earth that you gave. We are healed for you paid the price. By your grace we are saved. We are saved. He was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our sin. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, by his wounds, we are healed. We are healed. In the life that you gave, we are healed for you paid the price. By your grace, we are saved. We are saved. You know, as we take part in this part of the service, you can see as we look that this is unleavened bread. There's no leaven in it for it to rise because yeast symbolizes sin and Jesus' body was sinless, no sin at all. And so therefore the bread would be symbolic of his body. You also notice as it was cooked on a grill, it has the stripes that would be up and down for the grill marks, which would show the stripes that he took even before he went to the cross those great lacerations on his back from the cat of nine tails 
And then, of course, it was perforated like this is with the holes in it, showing the holes that he had to endure through his hands and through his feet to suffer that death for us in his body. Do you know that the early church, I wish we even had that today, the early church, it is written by historians, used to beg God for forgiveness for one reason, and that was because they believed they could not fully comprehend the suffering and agony that he did on the cross, which was caused by their sin. They couldn't fully comprehend that kind of pain, and so they would beg God to forgive them for that. Lord, I can't imagine what you went through. I can imagine nails in my hands. I can't imagine having my whole back peeled to where my organs were almost exposed. I can't imagine the agony on the cross. Please, God, I beg you to forgive me for that. That's how sensitive they were about the body of Christ and his suffering for us. This represents that body that was so beaten and bruised and agony and pain and why would he do that for us because he loves us you've heard me say before the rabbis used to try to ask the question why does God love us they never could answer that they finally all came back with an answer they said he loves us because he loves us that's the only answer you give if you add anything more than that you're wrong I'm wrong there's no reason for him to love me except he loves me that he loves me unconditionally he just chose to think of that and that suffering that he did when you take part in that and then the Bible says for when I received from the Lord that which I also received to you that the Lord Jesus in the night he was betrayed took bread and we had given thanks even knowing what he get, went, was about to go through, he gave thanks, and he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we also give thanks that you stayed on that cross. You suffered that agony. You suffered that pain. You suffered that torture for us, and we're most grateful. As we remember what you did. We remember that death you paid the price on. We remember that death on the cross. And we do thank you. And we praise you for dying for us, being the lamb that was slain to take away our sin. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take and eat. We're going to also have the men take the juice and we'd also ask you to do as we did with the bread take it and hold it while you're holding it and looking there think about the blood that Jesus shed for you let it be a personal time till we end up praying that it be a time that you remember what Jesus did for you on the cross Oh, mm -hmm. 
us that blood of Jesus is white as snow. You know, same way with the, uh, the bread. It's the same way with the juice. Symbolizes the blood of Christ. You know, there was a man in the 1800s that said, you know what, I don't believe this Lord's Supper juice should be anything that would contain alcohol, anything fermented. But the church has faced an issue. No refrigeration. Grapes right of season. Even if they were in season, could they get them and make it quick enough so it wouldn't prefer it? So they had a dilemma that, and he was a dentist in the 1800s that said, we need to solve this. So he began to look at what Louis Pasteur did with milk and thought, I wonder if I could do that with grapes. And he did. And he was over their church's communion and brought it and said, I've come up with a system now where this grape juice won't go bad. It'll be pure because of this way that, I, that the Lord shown me how to make it that way. The man, the dentist's name was Dr. Thomas Welch. His family started a company called Welch's Grape Juice. You may have heard of it. A man who said, I want to signify that this is pure and I want to come up with something that'll make it so. Because Jesus' blood was pure, untainted. Matter of fact, Peter said that we're purchased with the precious blood of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. It was pure and it was shed for us. Every drop of it was perfectly pure. And we are saved by it. Matter of fact, 2 Corinthians 5.21, one of my favorite verses, He made Him who knew no sin to become sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. That's the gospel. What does that say? To me, you know what it says? God treated Jesus as if he had committed all the sins of Tim Strickland so that he could treat Tim Strickland as if he had lived the perfect life of his son Jesus. You can put your name in that. That's what the blood of Jesus did for us. It made our sins as white as snow. The same way it says in that verse, in the same way he took the cup also after supper, saying, this is the cup of my new covenant for my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your blood. We thank you for that it was shed. We thank you that it was perfect blood, not tainted by sin. Lord, that as we look at this cup, we're reminded of the blood that was shed for our sin what it did for us, that it cleansed us from all unrighteousness. And we do, from the bottom of our heart, thank you for shedding it for us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take and drink. You know, that last part of that verse says this, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until... He comes. That's what's next. Amen. Is he coming? Amen. And he says he'll participate in this right. with us in the kingdom. Yes. In the millennial kingdom, we'll participate with him doing it. Yes. Right. Won't that be glorious? Yes. And so this song that we're going to sing, it said that the disciples sang a song when they'd finished the Lord's Supper. And this one talks about the time we will be with him again. So let's stand and let's sing as we finalize the Lord's Supper. Jesus has overcome and the grave is overwhelmed the victory is won he is risen from the dead I will
Amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Give him praise because he's well deserved of it. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Just a few things to close out as we wrap up. Uh, first of all, we're having our chili cook-off. Put it on your calendar. It's a chili cook-off and volunteer appreciation all in one. And it's going to be a great time of fellowship. It should say 6.30, not 6. But it's Wednesday night, January the 31st at 6.30. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet uh, poster in the lobby. And you can sign up to bring chili or sides. And it's just going to be a great time. Whether you volunteer or you don't, it's going to be a fun time. So come and be a part of this. And uh, we look forward to having a great time of fellowship together. Uh, also, to our first-time guests, uh, we told you about the card that you filled out. If you'll take that, we're so glad that you're here to uh, worship with us. And we just, uh, from the bottom of our heart, just are thankful because we're just praying God will just draw people to our fellowship and be able to be family members, and we'll just all worship together. So it's been a blessing to us. So if you'll take that card, uh, uh, my wife and I, Rebecca, will be out in the lobby. We'd love to meet and greet you and be able to give you a, that gift that we'd like to share with you. So also, don't forget your tithes and offerings. Be faithful in your giving. That's part of our worship. He's given us only three things, time, talent, and treasure, and he asked for us to give that back a portion of it for him because it's all his, but this is a reminder that it is all his, and it's not ours because uh, it could be taken away like that. But you can give in person, online, or you can drop it in the offering boxes uh, as you're part of your worship as you exit out as well. Also, our Christmas offering, uh, praise God, we're at 35000 from our goal of thirty-two, And so we praise God for that. But it's still uh, a Sunday that you can give. This is the last Sunday that we'll be asking. And you say, well, it's already been met. Remember I told you last week, I don't think anybody's going to say, we don't know what to do with this extra stuff. You know, it's just uh, we can't think of how we can bless our missionaries that way. Well, you can continue to give. Maybe you didn't get an opportunity to give that Christmas mission offering. Just put on the envelope for missions, and it'll all go just toward that. Amen? Uh, also, we're going to wrap up today is our day that we start our new lift group. So if I ask our lift group leaders uh, to come up to the front uh, for just a moment, uh, these are our small group leaders that are leading this study. There are some of them that meet uh, in, on Sunday mornings. And uh, so uh, Bob's group meet, meets in a home nearby. Uh, sounds like in a home, like that's a nursing home. That's a, <laughs> they meet in his home. That sounds better. That is, it wasn't like they're taking out their false teeth. <laughs> so they're meeting at 4 o'clock on Sunday evenings in their home nearby. And so Danny meets right after church here in the fellowship hall, and they do their small group there. So that's, you just go all the way to the back to the fellowship hall for that one. And then Mike, he does his at 5.30 at, 530 at his home, and which is nearby as well. And then Brad uh, is doing his right after church in Sean and Angela's house, and they can give you the directions for that. They have their little handouts that they can give you uh, to show where they are. If you want to talk to one of them or all of them, uh, get some information. It begins today. It's a great series in First and Second Peter. This is our discipleship programs where you can grow deeper in the Lord. It's an opportunity for you to ask questions about the Bible. You know, this format here on Sunday morning is not that. A place to meet people, a place to make friendships, a place where, man, if you're in the hospital or whatever, a group of people that can bring food to your home. All kind of ministry goes on in our small group. So get plugged in. It's it's. It's part of how we get people connected to the body of Christ. And so can't encourage you enough to participate in that. I'm going to have them stay up here uh, while I go greet our guests. So they'll be up here to answer any questions that you might have. Amen. Thank you all for your worship. It was great. I appreciate it very much. And uh, Brother Terry, if you'll close us out in prayer, I'll go greet our guests. Father, we thank you for today and the great message of, uh, of the Lord's Supper, Father for uh, being our sacrifice and for delivering us from our sins. I ask that you go with us this week, Father, and we would be uh, encouraged to do that which you've taught us to do and re required of us. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>